Hello and welcome to Magic the Gathering for Advanced Players. Top 5 ways you might be cheated with a cheating scandal rocking the poker world. I thought we'd check in on well, how does this stuff show up in a Magic tournament. Um, some of the things actually, there are some commonalities. I mean, trying to see things you can't, you're can't, not supposed to see, have information you're not supposed to have, what's premeditated, what's opportunistic. Well, let's talk about some things I've seen in my career. And believe me, I've had players DQ'd. I've gotten players suspended from the DCI. So you don't want to pull this shit on me, but I also want my viewers to have some of these tools, know what to look for. You know, I was watching last night this Forensic Files episode, and they talked about someone getting poisoned slowly, and they said, we're not going to reveal on this episode how they made it tasteless. And I thought, oh shit, I'm preparing to do this thing on cheating. Am I going to be enabling cheaters? Then I thought, wait a minute, I'm talking about the top five ways these are obvious, they're well known. The folks who want to cheat are going to find this stuff naturally. Some of it's even opportunistic. So believe me, I'm not going to show anybody how to pull the rabbit out of the hat. What I'm going to do is shine a light on this stuff and then everyone can identify it, call a judge, get folks DQ'd. That's the only way we're going to get to the bottom of this. So let's dive in. I got to get over to here and okay. Number five, way you might get cheated. And these are ranked in what I have is a rough approximation of how likely stuff is to happen. So this is up the bottom of our list, lying to a judge. Doesn't happen all that often in something that Jim Carrey wasn't able to do in the movie pictured here, which I probably should use as a thumbnail. Um, top five ways you might be cheated. Number five, lying to a judge. So how does this come up? Well, obviously judges get called to the table. You're going to explain your side of the story. They're going to explain theirs. Sometimes their side of the story is a fabrication. Sometimes it's a lie by omission. They're not going to mention stuff. I'll give you an example that I had. I had a player who was, this is at a Grand Prix recorded feature match, or maybe it wasn't recorded, but a feature match. There's a, a table judge watching the match. So a table judge sitting right to my right. And the opponent has an Eidolon of the Great Revel. Every time someone casts a spell, they take two, blah, blah, blah. So every time I'm, I'm play a couple, I play a couple spells into it, he's Johnny on the spot. Take two damage. Take two damage. I say go. Opponent draws a card. Plays a spell that costs less than three. Looks at me. Picks up the pen. Continues to look at me. And like I said, I've been I've been around the block, so I don't move. I'm like I'm I'm a I'm a cool customer in these spots, so I'm not making it up. But I just I don't move. Look, you got to point your own triggers out. You can't look at me and say is he gonna get it or not. Looks at me, a couple beats go by, puts the pen down, says go. Well, at this point, I turn to the judge on my right. Judge, uh, I believe my opponent, I actually might have even asked to step away from the table. This is one of the tools we're going to talk about. I may have asked to step away from the table, but I said, I, I don't remember. I said, I know I said this though. Judge, I believe that my opponent knew their Eidolon was supposed to trigger, but because it was to their detriment, they looked to me to identify it, made eye contact, picked up the pen. I'm hoping that you saw what I saw. You're sitting on my side of the table. I'm just hoping. And then, you know, we might have caught a hanger here, as they say. The judge is nervous. Um, unfortunately, the judge kind of just wasn't looking for that. They were kind of more controlling other aspects, what are spectators up to. And I get it, right? When you have a, a judge next to you, they're not always there to watch the match and, and look for what you're looking for. So I, I didn't say it with like a, this judge sucks if they don't. I just was hoping that they identify it. Judge didn't see what I saw. Whatever. I said, well, I know what I saw. Okay, let's ask the opponent. Opponent says, no, I didn't pick up the pen. And I don't remember. And I wasn't, you know, the opponent just basically said I didn't pick up the pen. And I didn't do that. And I didn't know the eye had triggered. So in my view, that was lying to a judge and me getting cheated. The judge didn't have enough evidence to rule it that way, so that's not how it went down. It went down as a vanilla warning for fail, you know, for mistrigger or whatever, and life moves on. But to protect yourself, you want to try to, if you can, I mean, well, first of all, first line of defense, actually understanding the game state, spotting the error. you got to know that that island does two damage to the opponent. So obviously that's just like you got to be sharp with these cards. But once you identify it, don't let people look you in the eye and make you point out their triggers. They do that, stare right, stare right back at them, stare into their soul, make them realize you know what's going on. They better point out their own trigger. If they don't, that's when you call a judge. And if that happens enough times, I mean, maybe maybe that judge sees this player do this again. Maybe they 
thought about it more and decided to watch that player next round. I mean, you don't, judges sometimes will do that. If you don't get the judge involved, they can't help. If you don't tell them a clear, coherent story about what happened that's honest and accurate, so you got to show up with your honesty and transparency, and the judges can take it from there, and eventually these folks get caught. So that's just an example. Um, and I think the other thing you can do is kind of shout it from the rooftops, right? So I told folks, I don't remember at this point, and, and you know, at this point, this is ancient history, but... You know, you want to tell other players, you know, look out for this person. Here's what happened. I think it's actually, it, you don't want to start a witch hunt and say, hey, I'm going to tweet out a photo of the guy or put it on my YouTube channel. I'm not saying necessarily do that, but at least, I mean, have a conversation. And the more confident you are, and here I couldn't, there's no way I could be 100% confident. The more confident you are, the more likely you should be to blast somebody, right? So I think putting, on, putting them on blast makes sense if you're highly confident. If someone says, hey, that card never touched the graveyard, and you know they put, picked that out of the graveyard. In that spot, like you should probably be just be like literally posting that person's name on Twitter, right? I mean, I think, Finny, I think um, the more convinced you are, the more likely you push, put the person on blast. And in any event, let judges know. So put them on blast that way. Let judges know this is a player that that I have a strong suspicion cheated. So I've done that in the past as well. Hey, judge, I'm not saying I, I got the smoking gun in my hand. But go check and take a look at that player. So look out for lying to a judge and try to understand what, what's the kinds of evidence. So when I said picking up the pen, that's again that's a piece of evidence that a lot of players wouldn't have realized to even mention. But that's really, really important to that particular cheat of the Eidolon exploitation. Because the opponent's impulse was, oh, I'll pick up the pen. All right. Drawing extra cards. This one's lower on the list now. I mean, this used to be like what you think of, at least when I started playing 15, 20, uh, well, when I started playing tournaments competitively 20 years ago. You think of well, what happens if the opponent draws extra cards? It still, it still is gonna, it still happens from time to time. It's not gonna be number one or two on my list because it, it's a pretty brazen cheat, and you can kind of check it a little easier than some of the other cheats. But this also includes, you know, pulling a card out of your sleeve or not, not the sleeve it's in, but the sleeve of your of your jacket. you you know, you're pulling a card out of your coat pocket, having a card in your lap. I mean, this stuff happens. What I want to remind, obviously, you're gonna try to identify it when it happens. You try to keep a card count, the basic stuff that people talk about. But the advanced protection here is actually to look out for the distraction tactics that often accompany this. So a player who kind of seems shady in some way and then later... But think, did the opponent have a life total discrepancy? I've seen this one multiple times. Life total discrepancy. They say, oh, you're at 15. Now you got to look at your life pad and kind of recreate. And then while you're doing that, they're pulling that card out of their lap. I mean, that's that's been used by cheaters before. They may... Um, they may distract you by dropping a card on the ground or, you know, there's, uh, again, this is not a playbook for cheaters and also it just, it takes different shapes and sizes. Something that's going to divert your attention. Remember this, this, we're talking about sleight of hand type of stuff. Well, how does sleight of hand work? If you're a magician, if you're a cheater, distraction is like a huge part of the game, misdirection of your attention, whatever you want to call it. So you're going to, in magic, there are going to be those moments where they knock a die over, they have the wrong life total. Those are mostly innocent, but you also got to understand that those are also things that people can use to misdirect, to distract. So I've had this happen before to me, unfortunately, and I didn't realize till after the match. And I and I'm was pretty strongly convinced that a player, you know, had a life total discrepancy in order to get me distracted, and then drew a card at their sideboard. Well, when I'm staring down at my life pad, going, "Wait, were they at?" 13 or 14 and they said they gained life two turns ago and then then they go well okay yeah you're right oh you know you're right i missed the fetch land again that's innocent nine, 19 times out of 20 but that 20th time the point the players drawing card their sideboard you, you know you hope to spot it if, if you think about it after the fact again let the judges know hey i think this happened if it happens again in the tournament there's more evidence for them or someone they want to look at I think having a dialogue with judges is fine. If they say, well, that sounds like nothing we can go on, fine. They can't go on it. But at least they have the information if something comes up later. Number three, Mark Sleeves. This is famously, uh, these, this is an image of, well, not the Trey Van Cleave part of it, but setting aside this, the, the arrows point to marks that were on Yuya Watanabe's sleeves. This DQ let me into a top eight of a, magic, of a mythic championship that I got second place in. So... This worked to my benefit through no knowledge of my own. I thought I got ninth. And then I didn't play against you in the tournament or anything. Just someone else pointed it out in a deck check, whatever. They caught the sleeves. And the evidence was very strong that this player was marking their sleeves. 
this is the rare instance where someone gets caught smoking gun style, how you explain that these are only on the towers, not the mines. Like this is the rare example. More commonly, I think is even, it's even sometimes opportunistic, sometimes premeditated. Some players are going to maybe make marks on their cards. You know, oh, all my infernal tutors have a certain mark. Maybe a bad example. Since a friend of mine plays Storm, I'm, I'm not saying that's what happened. I just thought of a random example. Let's say, let's pick a different example. Um, you know, someone has their uh, mental misstep. You know, their one copy of Mental Misstep and Vintage, and there's a little mark on it. That could, that could be happening in some spots. In other spots, you know, where it can develop. And if I, just, if I notice in game one, there's a giant thumbprint on the back of, of Raska's Contempt. And then in game two, I see the top card of my deck has a thumbprint. Well, that's like an opportunity. I know that's more likely to be Raska's Contempt or it is Raska's Contempt. That one comes up opportunistically. And again, you don't know... Do they know what that... If you see a thumbprint on a card, you don't know if that was put there on purpose or an accident. You don't know if they know what card it is or don't know what card it is. You don't know if they're even looking for it or not looking for it. So how do you protect yourself? Well, you protect yourself from your opponent doing it by understanding where their eyes going. Is my opponent like staring at the top card of their deck and then deciding whether to keep or mull? That's an indicator that this is a player I got to think of. I, maybe I want to talk to a judge about the fact that's happening if it looks really suspicious, or I want to look at the card to make sure that card they're looking at is totally uniform and consistent with the other sleeves. And don't be shy, because look, if an opponent told me, hey, you stared at the top of your card of your deck before deciding to keep, that may be nervous, I want to look at the top of that card. Like, I think that's a natural, I mean, it seems harsh and accusatory, but that's natural. Like, that's my bad for looking at the top of the deck, for staring at the top of the deck. And, I, and if I go, well, that's, I'm superstitious that way, or that's part of my routine. Well, that's maybe true, but that's part of my routine I want to rethink. So let's turn now to how to protect yourself from being accused of this. Well, yeah, don't have a bad habit of staring at your deck when it's not relevant. You don't want to be a person that stares at your library all the time. It looks fishy. Also, you don't want to be a person that's, that has thumbprints on their cards and nicks and chips and whatever and isn't fixing those sleeves, isn't replacing, re-sleeving the entire deck if there's multiple cards. So re-sleeve, rotate your sideboard cards through if your sideboard cards are wearing a different rate. You kind of want to... So this is, there's a popular wisdom around this. There's conversations that happen. And this is an example of what I think is like a bad, a good intentions, but I think a bad version of the advice. So this, this tweeter said, change your sleeves every tournament, also before day two of a Grand Prix. This is the only way to minimize wear and tear that causes sleeves to become marked. Notice I don't mean in a malicious way, just that this is basically unavoidable if you're randomizing correctly. Tweet number two, for purposes for this purpose, the cheapest sleeves are the best. How expensive your sleeves are will not cause them to become less marked due to wear and tear from normal shuffling. So use cheap sleeves, change them off. I think this advice like gets a couple things wrong in an important way. First of all, I don't think it's true that the cheap I think like the cheap ultra pro sleeves they give you or the ones that have like the planeswalker logo on the back, like those corners get worn a lot faster than your katanas, your ultimate pro eclipse even just your ultimate pro regular, your whatever, like those sleeves that cost you five or 10 are different than those sleeves that cost you three. I've noticed it, I've seen it, like you, you, you're not, you cannot convince me that the ultra pro logo backs wear the same as the ultra pro eclipse. You're just not gonna, I've just seen too much to know that that's not true. You're not gonna convince me that a glossy sleeve picks up fingerprints at the same rate that a matte sleeve does. You're not gonna convince me of that. It's just not true. And so this tweet misses that, and that's actually pretty important. If you don't want to get accused of cheating, like don't you, you might want to pay the extra five bucks. So shout out to the sponsor of my team, Ultimate Guard. I think their katanas are the best in the business. I don't have anything bad to say about Ultra Pro Clips either, though. So just something like that, like a matte sleeve that's professionally made, like those are going to be your best bet. So I disagree with that. And then like there's this thing about there's this common wisdom. Well, change your sleeves between day one, and day two of Grand Prix, or between tournament one and tournament two. Well, guess what? There's no magic fairy that sprinkles chip marks on the corners of your sleeves after round eight or nine, but before round 10. Like, no, this shit could happen in round five. This could happen in round 12. You actually want to have a more active approach and be looking out for, if you see a mark, replace the sleeve. If you know it's been several rounds, f five, six, seven rounds, check those sleeves between rounds. Are my sideboard cards the same amount of glossiness as my main deck cards? Again, this is where matte sleeves are going to serve you better than shiny sleeves or glossy sleeves. 
if, if the slide work cards are different, I gotta do something. I can shuffle it all, rotate the sleeves, whatever, or I can just re-sleeve right there. I gotta do something to make sure they're not marked. There's no pattern, I don't know what's going on. So anytime, if there's any question, I'm changing that sleeve. If there's, if there's any question about the overall wear pattern on the deck, I'm changing sleeves, even if it's round five, and I've got eight rounds. Maybe I'll change sleeves round five, play two rounds of them next day and change it round 11. Like Again, it's gonna depend. How high stakes is the tournament? At a pro tour, I, mean, I better be changing my sleeves more frequently than at Friday Night Magic because the risk of me being something that I don't see, me being accused of me is not there, like it's more real. If I'm, honestly, if I'm two and four in the tournament, I'm not gonna re-sleeve as often as if I'm six and oh. Because again, like what are the stakes? Like the stakes matter, We're talking. this is practical advice. The chances that I get accused of cheating are low if it happens and I'm two and four, it, the chance are even lower. Plus, like, it's just, it, it's gonna, I'm, it's gonna be less likely that I'm cheating at that tournament. It's just, again, it's kind of like a bluffing theory type of thing. Like, people are so much more likely to cheat when they're six and zero that you actually also want it to be more protective. Anyways, if you want to be safe, obviously do it whenever. But if, let's say I just didn't have access, I wasn't able to look at my sleeves and determine how, what the state where they're in. I just came up with a pattern of practice. I would be sleeping more often at a higher stakes event when I'm going to be at the top tables because there it's just so much more costly to be accused of, you know, to be disqualified from the tournament. So anyways, that's how I'm thinking about it. I'm certainly checking my sleeves. I'm looking for it. Um, and I'm not, it's not, there's nothing magic that happens between day one and day two. It's just something you always have to be on the lookout for. Um, and I just think that more expensive sleeves actually do serve you better and matte serve you better than gloss. It's just the way it works. Number two way you might be cheated, looking at the deck while shuffling. So opponents are going to shuffle with poor technique. Most of those opponents are simply using poor technique without the intent to cheat. Some of those opponents are using poor technique and intending to cheat. How do you know one from the other? You don't. What do I do? Not a tournament goes by, honestly. I don't play a tournament that's more than five or six rounds that at some point I don't not I don't tell one of my opponents you have to sh angle the cards differently you have to look away or both you cannot shuffle the way you're shuffling and so you know, so what's the diplomatic way to say it? you stop hey, can you stop for a second I just want to make sure when you're shuffling that you have the cards angled and you're looking in a way that where you cannot see the cards in your peripheral vision I'll say that to my opponent and an opponent may be surprised or offended fine get over it get, I've gotten over telling people having them be surprised and offended because you have to, that's the only way to protect yourself. I don't care if nine people out of 10 are doing it because they just have poor form. That 10th person needs to not have access to information about their deck or my deck. And we're gonna exchange decks, we're gonna shuffle each other's decks. And if they're doing, if, they're, if they have the deck positioned like this deck of poker cards here, and their eyes are anywhere near the vicinity, I mean, this, regardless of where your eyes are, if you're shuffling like this, that's inappropriate because it's so easy for your personal vision to catch what lands or where, or, or if you're talented at doing it, this cheat has happened. Don't allow this. You've got to angle the cards, and you should be looking away as well. So when I'm shuffling to protect myself, I'm getting into the habit. You can practice at home. Shuffle with, it, with the deck bottom tilted downward. Look away. Make sure the way you're shuffling is mixing top and bottom cards. There's a way of ripple shuffling that doesn't change the top seven cards. So I've got a lot of these peccadillos, stuff that really eats at me when people talk about shuffling and randomizing. People say, you know, pile shuffling is not even really shuffling, but riffle shuffling is this this pure thing that can't that's you know, unassailable. It's like, no, that's bullshit. Pile shuffling does make it harder to track where things are. It's not perfect. In combination with riffle shuffling, riffle shuffling alone, if they're not cha you could actually riffle shuffle a hundred times and not change the top card of the deck. So so that's your gold standard for shuffling. No, there's good shuffling and there's bad shuffling. I agree pile shuffling is not worth the time you invest other than I think it's worth it once to count. And if I was the czar of the world of the magic organized play world, I'd say everyone pile shuffles exactly once to count their deck and then you riffle, fine, but I don't like the pile shuffling is not shuffling and I really don't like riffle shuffle being this thing where everyone does it the right way. No, it's actually there's a lot of technique to it. I can I see the cards? Am I sure the top card and the bottom card are being changed with each riffle or at least every couple riffles? Am I doing it a sufficient number of times? Am I not doing it too much every shuffle? So if I'm playing fetch lands in my deck, I can't finish the round on time. I mean, all these things matter when it comes to shuffling a proper technique. So obviously like that could be a separate video of its own, but 
Um, with this one, you gotta just don't be ashamed. Tell the person, hey, that, that's not proper technique, and stop them. Do not do not pick my deck up that that ninety degrees off the table. That doesn't work for me. So tell people that. Number one thing that's going to, most likely to come up in matches you play: opportunistic game rule violation. So this is not necessarily the opponent who sits down intending to cheat. So if you look at you know example four. Maybe there's someone who sits down with a card in their lap and they know, okay, if I need this Hornet Queen, I'm, I'm, I'll go grab it from my lap or under my notebook, whatever. That, that's different. And that and obviously there's a line, it blurs. Some people, maybe you exiled the card last game, they forgot to shuffle in, they notice. Instead of calling a judge, they have that now, that's in their back pocket, maybe it makes its way over to their hand. Like, this could be opportunistic too. But I'm talking about here, when something comes up, a discrepancy with life totals, or a creature that should be in the graveyard but it's not, or um, I mean, any any number of things. Someone you know scries and sees a card that's not in their main deck, but it's game one. Well, scrying that to the bottom instead of calling a judge, an opportunistic game of violation. That's cheating. So this is the number one way you're most likely to get cheated. Let me give you an example. Mythic Championship London. I'm playing in round the end, towards the end of day one, if not the last round of day one. I'm playing against an opponent who is Japanese, which is important because we, we have a, there's always going to be a communication challenge when there's a language barrier. We're not, we don't speak the same language. We can't communicate as clearly, as quickly, as efficiently. However, what happened in the game, I attack with a 1-1 creature. Opponent writes down their life pad 16. But I write down 17 because I had mistakenly put, I misread my, my 17 on my life pad as an 8. I have sloppy handwriting. My 7 looked like an 8. So what happened was, not knowing at the time I wrote down, I wrote down 17. They wrote down 16. They saw that I wrote down 17 and they corrected their life pad to 17 without saying, hey, I actually have myself at 16. So we call a judge. Now, do I think that this opponent sat down with the intent, oh, you know what, I'm going to get a free life off of Matt Spurling this match. I'm going to get him. No, I don't think this is pre match. I think, again, opportunistic. I think what happened was the opponent kind of shrugged. Well, um, you know, they have it 17. That's better for me. I'll agree with them. Kind of that kind of thing, right? And I've even heard a player say, oh, yeah, what's the problem with that? Like, they know they know their life total is better than me. Like, maybe I'll just roll with it. Well, the reality is in a pro tour, we're talking about Mythic Championship London, at any level of tournament, but especially at a pro tour, that's just not good enough. You can't say, well, I dis we disagree on life totals, but I'll go with their interpretation because it favors me. Because obviously, like, you might not go with it if it was 15 and it doesn't favor you. So we call a judge. I explain to the judge what happened. It turns out the judge, head judge was actually watching over our shoulder. So the judge actually had an independent observation of what happened. Based on what I saw, based on what that judge saw, the judge conducted an investigation, used a translator. At the conclusion of that investigation, that player was disqualified from the tournament. Why was that player disqualified from the tournament? Because it's not just an honest mistake. It's the failure to, it's an opportunistic failure to correct that, to actually ask me the question, wait, wh what do you have for life total? Let, what's the right answer? You, so that's, I mean, that's an example, right? That's why the life pads are here on the thing. There are many other examples, right? You might lightning bolt a Tarmogoyf and you don't realize that, you know, it's going to become it's going to become too big, or sorry, your Goyf gets bolted. And, you know, it, the power and toughness is, is one thing. The opponent, and then you attack with it, it gets chump blocked. Your opponent forgets that the bolt already happened. I mean, whatever. So one of these situations, and after combat, your creature has lethal damage on it. So however it happened, my example was horrible, forgive me. Whatever the example is, Tarmo is the one where it's easy to not understand what his power and toughness is. That's why I try to use it as an example. But anyways, after combat, the Tarmo is a 4-5. It's got five damage on it, but your opponent thinks it only has four damage on it. Do you have to put it in the graveyard? The answer is absolutely. You got to put that card in the graveyard. It's a creature with lethal damage on it. It's headed to the yard. The players who don't or who look to you to see whether you realize it had damage on it or whether you realize the card had been exiled and that shrunk the growth. So the players who are not putting their creatures with lethal damage in, the players who are you know, that, that Eidolon example, which I used for lying to the judge, that was also an example of, you know, opportunistic game rule violations. I'm remembering my own triggers. If they're good for me, I'm, I'm not remembering them. If they're bad for me. It's not always cheating, but sometimes it is. We've got to identify those for the judges so they can be tracked. 
the player who does this 10 times over two months is a lot different than the player who does it once or twice over two months. I mean, you got to track these things. And um, don't, again, no, don't feel the shame, the shame or, or like it's strongly accusatory to call a judge or to say, hey, you know, I, I, I'm not, what's going on here? Why are you missing that trigger when it benefits you? Wh however you're pointing it out, you're calling the judge, whatever. That's your right to do it as a player. And in fact, you should do it. It protects you and it protects other players. So make sure you're pointing that stuff out in addition to tracking it in the game. You're tracking the game so you're helping the judges track it. Really important. So recap. Someone's lying to a judge. If it's obvious, put them on blast. Use a judge's help if, it's, if you're not sure. Um, but I think like as a community, if you got people lying to a judge, oftentimes it ends up in a he said, she said, for lack of a better term. And if you end up in that spot, I want to hear about it because if you know the person is just literally just saying, I, I didn't draw that, I didn't touch my library and you saw them draw the card, like that's rare. If it happens, we got to talk about it. Drawing extra cards. Watch out for those distraction tactics. Is my opponent using a life total discrepancy or a, a, a knocked over a die or a drink or whatever? Watch out for that. That could be something that's used to distract you. Try to catch those folks or after the fact, let a judge know what you think might have happened. Mark sleeves. Protect yourself from accusations by changing sleeves in a, in a, in a time at an interval and with a frequency that's appropriate for the types of sleeves you have, the types of wear you're putting on them, the type of tournament you're in. Um, if there's any doubt, obviously change the sleeve. To protect yourself from your opponent, you know, watch where their eyes are going. Watch, is the opponent looking at the deck in weird spots? Do, you know, when asked about it, do they just say, well, that's my superstition? Well, look, I think we, we should call out that habit and make those players change that habit because of what's happening. We just saw, had a player from the Magic Pro League disqualified for this. It's time to get rid of that habit. Watch where your eyes go. Protect yourself from the accusation. Number two, looking at cards while you shuffle them. So you're going to want to watch where your eyes go. And so you don't get accused. You're going to want to watch where your opponent's eyes are and how what angle is the deck at. There's absolutely no shame asking the opponent for proper shuffling technique. We're going to have to do it if we're going to play serious tournaments, high stakes tournaments. Number one, opportunistic game or violations. Look, look out for pauses. Like, like when my opponent paused waiting for me to notice their trigger. Well, why are they pausing if they don't know there's a trigger there? So watch out. For, that's a way to spot it. Look for corrections in the life pad. Why did they write down 15 then put 14? Is that because I had myself at 14 by mistake? Like, look out for that. The opponent who's fetching, are they writing down their life loss for the fetch? Or are they waiting for me to do it? If they're waiting for me to do it, maybe a judge ought to know that they're not doing it. So maybe I'm going to sit there and not do anything and then call a judge. Hey, they didn't pay their life. Talk up to a judge about that. Get them a warning. It helps to track. The, again, the players who do this a lot are the ones we want to find out about. If they're too sloppy to play high level... Too bad, so sad. I mean, you gotta play, you gotta execute your deck if you're gonna play Paper Magic. Practice with the deck so you don't get warnings accumulated. If you happen to get three game rule violations and honest mistakes, you get a game loss, you gotta take your lumps and say, look, I gotta get better at executing the deck. I've seen players with no intent of cheating try to execute, you know, Kark Clan Ironworks combo and they can't do it without getting a game rule violation. Well, that's part of being able to execute the deck. You can't do it, you, you can't, you might not be able to play that deck without getting those warnings and game losses. Not saying you're cheating, but this all goes part and parcel. You gotta practice, become proficient at it, keep yourself from being accused of it, and you gotta be looking out for what other people are doing and calling judges on them. Thanks for checking this out. Subscribe to the channel if you like this type of content for advanced players, tournament magic. How do we think about it? How do we improve? Not just the basics, but one layer above. Subscribe if you like that kind of content. Thank you.